what we're talking about is raising important issues at the highest level of the international community at the UN Security Council and raising rights issues that North Korea doesn't want to have discussed and that China is trying to protect North Korea from. Seeing. And, uh, you know, by discussing these issues there, we will have a continued impact on the uh, the thinking of the leadership in North Korea and uh, its protector in Beijing. We'll come back to that interview in just a moment. From Asia News Weekly, this is Asia Now, the podcast featuring stories and interviews from the Asia Pacific region. Another year has passed and the United Nations has once more condemned human rights abuses in North Korea. Is the international community putting more pressure on the dictatorial regime or not? That's today's conversation taking place in Asia, now. Hey everyone, Steve Miller here on this Saturday, the 28th of November 2015. Thank you so much for joining me, either by listening to the podcast on our website, on YouTube, or in your favorite podcast application. Now, back in February of 2014, Michael Kirby, a former Australian judge, led the United Nations Commission of Inquiry on North Korea's alleged human rights violations. The COI, as it was called, spawned a massive 372-page report detailing wide-ranging abuses, including prison camps, systematic torture, starvation, and killings comparable to Nazi-era atrocities. In fact, Kirby himself said, quote, The United Nations is about to meet a moment of truth. The essential question will be whether the United Nations will stay the course and adhere to making the principle of accountability of great crimes a reality. End quote. Well, here we are a year later. The UN has just passed another resolution condemning rights abuses in the so-called Democratic People's Republic of Korea. It's the same process that's been followed time and time again for more than a decade. Well, has any difference really been made? That's the question I put to Phil Robertson, Deputy Director of Human Rights Watch's Asia Division. I think it's important that we do pass these resolutions because it reminds North Korea that uh, the international community is watching and that they don't get a free ride, uh, that people uh, are focused on what's happening in North Korea and, and expect change to take place. You know, without these uh, resolutions, you know, we're not able to spring to uh, next steps. And, you know, it was these resolutions that we've seen over the years finally made the United Nations decide that a commission of inquiry was uh, finally, was called for and, and is uh, taken the next step of taking North Korea into the UN Security Council uh, and discussing their human rights problems there. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, we have the Commission of Inquiry, and Michael Kirby, who led the commission, said essentially that the United Nations was at a crossroads about holding individuals accountable. And he was really trying to make a point that the United Nations need to take actions. Now, is the United Nations doing enough well, I think the United Nations could always do more, but the United Nations is doing a lot. Uh, what we see is the issue of North Korea coming up at resolutions at the UN Human Rights Council, at the UN General Assembly. Uh, we're expecting that the, the UN Security Council will uh, cover the issue uh, while the U.S. is in chairmanship. Uh, ideally, sometime next month, we'll be discussing human rights at the Security Council. And also that there is a now an office of the high commissioner established in Seoul, South Korea, that is investigating human rights abuses in North Korea, continuing to build the dossier of uh, these rights abuses uh, so that it may be possible sometime in the future for prosecutions to take place. Now, if we take a look at the United Nations itself, you mentioned things being brought up to be discussed in the Security Council. And I want to get your opinion. Do you think that... For lack of a better word, the political process with the United Nations, because China has a veto ability in the Security Council, and it's always suspected that they're going to use that to protect North Korea, is this a good process to follow? I mean, it is the process, but is it a broken process? It's, it's no, by no means a broken process. What we're talking about is raising important issues at the highest level of the international community at the UN Security Council. 
and raising rights issues that North Korea doesn't want to have discussed and that China is trying to protect North Korea from seeing. And, uh, you know, by discussing these issues there, we will have a continued impact on the uh, the thinking of the leadership in North Korea and uh, its protector in Beijing. I think that it's important to recognize that those kind of discussions at the Security Council hold North Korea's feet to the fire. Uh, the issue of the China veto only comes up if there's a decision to uh, go for a vote to try to refer uh, the human rights situation in North Korea to the International Criminal Court, the ICC, which can only be done in North Korea's case if the UN Security Council does it. And precisely because we know China will veto that, uh, we're not pressing for that maneuver right now. Uh, instead, we're biding our time. Uh, we're waiting for the situation to further develop, and we're uh, going to continue North Korea on, on every front possible until they finally recognize that uh, this issue is not going away. Their rights abuses are severe. Uh, they are... Uh, uh, among the worst in the world, and that uh, the United Nations, which embodies the principles and conventions on human rights, uh, is right to demand accountability, and the governments of the world around uh, back them up in that. Well, let's talk about the conditions in North Korea. Since a year has gone by, well, a little over a year since the Commission of Inquiry was released, a year has gone by since the last vote. How have human rights changed for the average person in North Korea in a year's time? To be honest, they haven't improved very significantly. I mean, what has changed primarily is uh, the increased difficulty for North Koreans to actually flee the country. The young leader, uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, has spent a great deal of time and effort to try to prevent uh, North Korean citizens from escaping across the North Korea-China border into China and has worked very closely with China to send North Koreans who escaped to China back to North Korea. And right now, for instance, we're facing a situation where nine North Koreans who were uh, arrested in Vietnam, deported back to China, uh, are now facing intimate uh, reformant back to North Korea, where I'm sure they will face uh, interrogation, torture, and, and possibly worse. So right now, uh, China and North Korea are sort of working hand in glove to try to starve off the, the path that many North Koreans are taking to escape the country. And that has made the situation in North Korea worse because uh, people are also depending on issues of cross-border trade, information coming from outside in order to try to hang on in North Korea. And so I, I think that unfortunately, uh, whatever's happening at the UN, it is not uh, having a significant change in the ordinary lives of North Koreans. Well, if we do talk about the things that are taking place in the United Nations, the vote in the Third Council, uh, Third Committee rather, uh, was essentially the same as it was last year. There wasn't a significant really increase in those voting for the measure. A few members opted to not abstain as much as last year. Are we seeing essentially a vote as good as it's going to get with the international community at the UN? Well, I'm, what we're seeing is an overwhelming vote for the resolution. Uh, you know, the, the vote is not even really close. And so, I mean, you know, whether whether the vote goes up five votes or down five votes on any given year, I think, uh, is of great interest to those diplomats that follow this thing on a day-to-day -day basis in New York. But the takeaway from our point of view is that uh, there's an overwhelming consensus in the international community that supports these resolutions and supports the United Nations in continuing to pressure North Korea on human rights. All right, one last question. Uh, what do you think it's really going to take to start making a difference with human rights abuses in North Korea? Is dealing with the United Nations still the best option? Or if that is still the case, who really needs to take the lead to make something happen? Well, I mean, obviously, the uh, United Nations uh, is important. The United Nations is critical to maintain the international pressure and contain and maintain the international coalition uh, that is determined to take action on human rights in North Korea. So uh, the U.N. process uh, can't be substituted for. It has to be there. Uh, but the question really is what else can be done beyond the U.N. process? I think... Uh, the key target has to be China. Uh, you know, I think if China changed its policy and allowed North Koreans to move freely through 
China to seek asylum in third countries, uh, you'd see a significant number of North Koreans prepared to take that chance. Uh, I think that, unfortunately, China has decided that it needs to continue defending North Korea in the international community, and therefore I think we need to make China pay a diplomatic price for that. We need to make people realize that China, by doing that, is defending one of the worst human rights abusers in the world. Uh, it is uh, defending a government that sends tens of thousands of people to labor camps uh, that has been involved in overseas exploitation of workers uh, that it sends out and then seizes their wages. Uh, and it's been involved in um, uh, extrajudicial executions uh, to make uh, citizens fearful of challenging the government. You know, this is a totalitarian government in its, in its most essence, uh, a throwback to the sort of uh, national socialist regimes that we saw during World War II, uh, you know, something that uh, really has no place in the 21st century. Right, and also we can't forget that China itself isn't, say, a bastion of glowing human rights as well. Well, that's true, but, uh, you know, I think that China and North Korea's political relationship has been more strained over the past several years than it's ever been before. And the question is, uh, what can we do to ultimately get China to recognize that it needs to be part of the solution for human rights in, in North Korea rather than a uh, core part of the problem? Well, what do you think it would really take to get China to turn that corner? Well, I think there's uh, uh, hundreds of experts trying to figure that out. Uh, you know, I mean, China has to be assured in some way, shape, or form that whatever replaces uh, the situation in North Korea, if there's, a, for instance, a change of government that then results in a unification on the Korean Peninsula, that that unified Korea would not be hostile to, to China. Uh, but, you know, I mean, this is a long way off. I mean, I think what we're talking about really right now is uh, chipping away at the North Korean government's uh, impunity, its unwillingness to face the fact that serious human rights abuses need to be answered for, uh, and the fact that the international community unified against them on human rights issues, and that the Commission of Inquiry is a scathing indictment that needs to be answered. Phil Robertson is the Deputy Director of Human Rights Watch's Asia Division. Thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome, Steve. And now I turn to you. What are your thoughts? North Korea isn't the only country out there with human rights violations. So what must we do as a collective society to bring about their end? More importantly, are we really willing to take up that challenge? Asia Now is a special feature of the Asian News Weekly Podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, please share it with your friends. And if you haven't, subscribe. Subscribing is absolutely free. And when you do, the next episode is delivered automatically to you. You can subscribe on our website, asiannewsweekly.net, or in your favorite podcast application. You can also keep up with more news from the region by following Asian News Weekly on Facebook or Twitter. And if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please drop us a line. The email address is podcast at asiannewsweekly.net. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, remember to be true to yourself and to always be awesome.